the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Oh, perfect redemption, a purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest offenders who truly obey, that moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Earth hear his voice, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done. And great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son And give him the glory, great things he hath done Let every heart rejoice and sing Let choral anthems rise Ye aged men and children, bring to God your sacrifice. For he is good, the Lord is good, and kind are all his ways. With songs and honor sounding loud, the Lord Jehovah prays. While the rocks and the rills, while the vales and the hills, a glorious anthem raise. Let each prolong the grateful song and the God of our fathers praise. And the God of our fathers praise. He bids the sun to rise and set. In heaven his power is known, and earth subdued to him shall yet bow low before his throne. For he is good, the Lord is good, and kind are all his ways. With songs and honor sounding loud, the Lord Jehovah praise. While the rocks and the rills, while the vales and the hills, a glorious anthem raise. Let each prolong the grateful song and the God of our fathers praise. And the God of our fathers praise. We'd like to welcome all of you here uh, to our uh, streaming of our uh, service, and we're grateful that you have chosen to worship with us, especially if you're a visitor. 
Uh, I know this isn't the way that we're used to doing things, but uh, it's, it's getting a little bit easier and a little bit easier as we go along, and we're so grateful that you continue to uh, sign in and be a part of our worship together. Uh, for all of our members, we have encouragement cards, and we want to remind you that um, every, there are many, many people on our list that need to be encouraged. So uh, if you don't have any, if you've run out, you can come back up here to the building and pick them up and uh, fill them out. Make sure that you put the person's full name on there so that uh, the person who ends up mailing it will know who it's going to. I'd like to read to you a, a scripture from Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet as that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his grace, Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love pay the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, Right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we will be singing How Beautiful. How 
beautiful lands that served the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads and the hill to the cross. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. How beautiful the radiant bride who waits for her light in her eyes. How beautiful when humble hearts give the fruit of pure lives so that others may live. How beautiful, how beautiful. the body of Christ. And as he laid down his life, we offer this sacrifice that we might live just as he died, willing to pay a price. Willing beautiful the feet that bring the sound of good news and the love of the king how beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth how beautiful Ephesians 2.13 says, I have been brought near to God through Christ's blood. Mark 14, 22 through 26 reads, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Two things. This is my body, and this is my blood. If you are members of this family or have spent much time with this family, then you know this is something that we do each first day of the week. We come together and we sing. I understand that. I love to sing. Singing refreshes me. It renews my soul. The words remind me of God's love for us, his grace, his mercy, his faithfulness. And we pray. I get it. To have a relationship with someone, there needs to be communication, right? We read scripture. It's good to read the owner's manual, right? How many of us has purchased a new car or major appliance and have not read the owner's manual? Depending on the purchase, you could get yourself into a lot of trouble if you don't read the owner's manual. 
It also usually sets the tone for the lesson or the sermon that Chad or one of our shepherds bring to us. We listen to a message or a sermon. I get it. The shepherds of this flock may tell Chad, we think the family needs to hear this or that. Or as in, is the case most of the time, Chad has worked to come up with a series of lessons on a particular subject or thought that the Holy Spirit has inspired him to preach to us as a family of believers. I get it. But in trying to come up with something to bring to you to prepare us for communing with our Lord and Savior, sometimes I admit, I just don't know how to do it justice. I think I have missed it a lot, precisely because I have tried to get it. My approach has been largely rational, trying to get my mind or thoughts around it, to understand it so I could be in the right state of mind. As a result, I, as I partake of the bread and the blood, I focused on thinking the right thoughts and feeling the right feelings. I wanted to have thoughts and feelings of awe and gratitude and repentance and humility. But when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are not entering into a religious ritual. Aren't we celebration a relationship? Aren't we approaching a person? Aren't we approaching the person of Jesus Christ? He is not somehow contained in the gift of the bread and wine. He is the gift, the physical reality of a human person standing before me, giving me bread and wine while saying, take it, this is my body, and this is the blood of my covenant. I implore you to drink it. It is as though, it is as though I am approaching Jesus himself, no, it's not as though I'm approaching Jesus himself. I am approaching Jesus himself. He is here right now. Let's all be transported back to that upper room and hear Jesus himself say, this is my body, this is my blood for you. I am hearing this from Jesus himself. I am receiving the bread and the blood of his covenant from Jesus himself. I am standing before the person of Jesus himself. Communion is not something we partake of. It's a relationship we enter into and celebrate. This is my body and this is my blood can be boiled down to three words. Me for you. Jesus says to you and me personally, me for you. It's me for you in the sense of God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, 2 Corinthians 5.21. It's me for you in the sense of if God is for us, who can be against us, Romans 8.31. It's me for you in the sense of I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. It's me for you in the sense of abide in me and I will abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me, John 15.4. It's me for you in the sense of the complete and total exchange of his wholeness for our brokenness and his fullness for our emptiness. Let's bow our heads now and pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread that to us represents your son's body, which was hung on that tree, on that cross, and where he suffered and died for our sins and our transgressions. 
We thank you, Father, for sending your Son so that we would have a chance to live with you eternally. We thank you now for this bread. In Jesus' name, amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Lord Jesus, thank you for these, those three words you say to us so many times and in so many ways, me for you. Pray, Father, that you hear me say that to you. Thank you, Father, for this fruit of the vine, which to us represents your son's blood on the cross. We ask, Father, that you would help us to partake of it in a way that would be pleasing in your sight. And may, may we all feel your presence with us as we partake. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Another part of worship that I didn't mention is giving. It is part of worship. And it's something that we do every first day of the week along with communion with our Lord. And there's three different ways that you have the opportunity to give. If there's someone here at the office, you can drop it off at the office, or if you have a key, you can come in, you can drop it off in the, in the foyer. There's two boxes in there, and they're locked. You can just drop it in. Or there's a post office box that you can send it to, and there's a slide right there. Mail contributions to box, post office box 764, Lodi, California. So let's pray for this opportunity to, and this blessing to be able to lay by in store as we have been blessed. Thank you, Father, for this time that we can give back to you a portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. Father, we th thank you for all of our blessings, especially for your son, Jesus. And we pray, Father, that the, the money that is collected here today or sent then will be put to good use and will glorify your name in this city and all over the globe. We thank you, Father, again for this opportunity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Keep silence, keep silence, keep silence be. This is a time in our uh, worship that we uh, 
spend some time in prayer. We call it intercessory prayer because we intercede for our brothers and sisters in Christ here within this congregation and for uh, loved ones and, and, and family of our, uh, of our church family here. So uh, at this time, would you bow with me and we'll take these uh, supplications to our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to you for, um, for loving us, for showing us what true love really is by sending your only son. Father, we want to learn to love like you love. But sometimes there's, there are things that are around us, things that are going on, especially right now, things that cause fear and distraction. And oftentimes we forget that the love that we need to share with the world needs to come first from our hearts and from our mouths. So I pray for all of us, Father, that you will uh, fill us with your spirit and speak your words of truth through us to those around us, that we may bring you glory and honor and, and help those who don't know you to come to know you better or to, to know you and then those who already know you to, to know you better. So Father, I'm, I want to thank you for all of those people that we, um, that are out there doing missionary work. I ask that you be with them, especially the ones that we support, that you will continue to um, fill them with your spirit and give them your words as they preach to the congregations, many of them more than one. I pray, Father, for this family of believers that we will be a family that is, uh, has a full understanding of unity and we live by it, Father. Um, help us to be your servants together. And uh, thank you for putting us all in this family together. I pray for uh, our youth that uh, we haven't had the opportunity to do classes with yet. And I pray, Father, that you will uh, keep their hearts and minds in close to you and that they will uh, look forward to the time as, as we do when we can all be back together and, uh, and have class again together. Father, for those who are sick, I pray, Lord, that you will heal them, each one in the way that they need. Father, we know oftentimes when we pray and ask for, for healing upon, uh, upon those people that, um, that sometimes you say yes and you heal them and we are amazed and we're grateful. And other times it's prolonged and sometimes you would say no. So Father, help us to understand and rem remember that, that you are perfect in all your ways and you always do what is right and what is best. But Father, we still pray and beseech you to heal uh, people like Lynn Gerritsen and, uh, and all the struggles that she's been going through. I, I pray for her daughter, April, that you will heal her of the MS that she has and help her to go through all the treatments and, and, and Lynn too through all of these changes in, in the, the, uh, the medicine that they give to her. I just pray, Father, that uh, you will make them work or just heal outright by your hand. I pray, Father, for Katrina <clears throat> and I pray for Mary Ann and for all of their family, for, for Lindsay, who's uh, still looking for a job, and Marianne, who's uh, 
who's been having problems with uh, her blood pressure. I pray, Father, that you will will uh, heal uh, them also. And I pray for Katrina and all that she, all the many problems that she has. I'm, I'm thankful that you brought her out of the, the last major uh, issue that she had that was um, where she lost some of her motor skills even. And Father, you brought her back from that. And we are so thankful. And we praise you and we thank you for that. F- Father, for... Uh, for the the ladies who are uh, pregnant within our within our congregation, I pray that you will watch over the children that are in their their mamas still uh, growing, and that you will begin to prepare them to be great servants for your kingdom. Uh, <clears throat> I pray for both Abby and Amy who are uh, who are going to have babies. And I pray that you will just watch over them. Father, I, um, I also ask that you will be with uh, Don Mims and Melba Mims, that you will lighten their burden of the, the health problems that they have. I pray for continued uh, health for Pat Hill. And I pray for Wendy French and for Colleen Pearson, who have uh, continued to, to struggle with uh, illness and, and cancer. And just watch over them, Father, and, and uh, just remind them that you are there and that they belong to you. Father, we end this time of prayer together and just thanking you for your son and the blood that he shed for us, and the love that you showed us and that he showed us by the giving freely of his very life for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for loving us that much. It's in his precious name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from an Old Testament book, Nahum, and from a New Testament book, Romans. In the book of Nahum, chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, and then verses 14 through 15. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news who proclaims peace. Celebrate your festivals, Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. And now from Romans chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. 
wonderful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Well, good morning, church. We are really grateful. We are thankful. We appreciate the fact that you are tuning in and that you are here with us for our online worship experience. I want to uh, invite you to and encourage you to come. We are still, weather permitting, having our outdoor parking lot service at 9 a.m. And we're going to hopefully continue to do that for a little bit longer while we are very prayerfully and carefully trying to uh, navigate and figure out the when, how of meeting indoors again. But I really anticipate that that's going to happen very soon. But in the meantime, we're glad that we have this time together like this, that you can join us from home, wherever you are. And for those of you choosing to come out and spend some time in some outdoor worship and some social distance fellowship, that's good as well. Uh, in your bulletin that was emailed to you and online as well, there's an outline for today's lesson. And we're going to pick back up. We're going to continue our study in the Minor Prophets. We, we've called this series Major Messages from the Minor Prophets. We are uh, halfway through looking at the uh, 12 Old Testament books, the very last 12 books in your Old Testament that is known as the Minor Prophets prophets. We have went through six of them. Today we're looking at the seventh of those minor prophets, the prophet Nahum. Now I entitled my message today, as you can see right here on the screen, uh, uh, the, the, the feet that bring good news. And I called it that because of Nahum chapter 1 verse 15. The, the very end of this first chapter, Nahum says this, look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news who proclaims peace. So this idea of feet that bring good news is something that is seen several times throughout the scriptures in both the old and we're going to see in our message today, even in the New Testament. Now, to say that the, the book of Nahum is a book of good news totally depends on from whose perspective you're reading it from. It depends on who the reader is as to whether or not this is actually good news. Because to the people of God, to Judah, what they are reading in Nahum is going to be some good news. But to the city of Nineveh, who this book is directed to, who this minor prophet is preaching a very major message to, well, it's not exactly good news. And I think you'll see why that is when we dig in this morning. So on your outline, I just have three things I want to give you about this uh, prophet Nahum. There, there's three chapters. It's a small, easy read. Um, it's, it's, it, it was a difficult book for me to process and, and to prepare exactly how I was going to preach and, and proclaim this message. Because it, it, it's a good message on one hand, but it's a confusing and, and not a good message to, to like the people of Nineveh of this time. And so I was really thankful that last week we had an opportunity to uh, do our Shepherd Sunday to, to affirm and install uh, Randy along with our other elders, our pastors, our shepherds here, which gave me another week to kind of uh, think about and pray over this. But there are three, I think, major messages, three things I want you to know and to understand from this book. So grab your outline, follow along, let's fill in the first blank. Number one, you need to understand that the book of Nahum is actually written as a sequel to the book of Jonah. This is not really a Jonah part two, but in some ways, uh, Nahum sort of picks up 
where Jonah may have left off. It's a sequel. Now remember, Jonah goes to the city of Nineveh via a very unique transportation route, right? He was in the belly of a, of a great fish, maybe a whale or whatever. He's, he's thrown up onto the sea. He finally goes reluctantly to Nineveh. It says it takes him three days to walk around the town. The city of Nineveh was a great city in its day from what, what we understand reading in history. Uh, he preaches this very short message that's basically, hey, in seven days... You guys, are, or, or rather in a, in a month and 10 days, in like 40 days, you guys are going to be toast if you don't repent. And they do repent. So in, now we pick up with Nahum. And in Nahum chapter 1, the very first verse that, here on the screen, it tells us that this is a prophecy concerning Nineveh. So this is about the same town. This is the same city. At this time, Nineveh is the capital city of the nation of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire. And at this time, from like the 9th century all the way through about the 7th century BC, the Assyrian Empire was like the powerhouse nation of the world. I mean, they more or less conquered and ruled the, the, the middle, whole Middle East from what we know of it in biblical times. And the biblical account, when you read about the Assyrians throughout the prophets and especially in the, the kings and the chronicles that kind of give us some history of God's people and their interaction with nations like Assyria, well, we read that they were a very cruel, they were very fierce, they, they, they were merciless. Uh, they showed like, like, like no mercy to the people that they, they would take captive. And this, of course, included uh, God's people. They more or less wiped out the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom is still there, but uh, kind of being uh, totally, they're invading all the time and just a horrible, cruel nation towards God's people. Now, this explains why when Jonah was told to go preach repentance to Nineveh, he didn't really want to go. He's like, man, these, these people are horrible. They don't deserve your forgiveness, God. They don't deserve your repentance, God. I don't want to go. But God, of course, uh, convinces him to go. God shows mercy to them. They do repent, and God shows his mercy. And now we have this story again about Nineveh, a prophecy concerning Nineveh. So verse 14, here's what it is. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You, now listen to this, you will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and the idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave for you are vile. Man, unlike Jonah who comes and offers this this message of repentance, this, this message of hope, this message of if you repent, God will forgive you. Nineveh now is receiving a message from God that it's too late. Time is up. I, I am about to wipe you out completely. And history tells us that they do get wiped out. Uh, completely. God is no longer going to put up with their wickedness. God is no longer going to put up with their evil ways. Now, Jonah and Nahum uh, is really not that far apart when you look at it in the Bible. I mean, when, when you read from Jonah uh, with the order that we have them in, in our Old Testament, well, you only have a book, uh, Micah, that we covered a couple weeks ago, and then boom, you're right to Nahum. But in history, in the time that uh, Jonah would have taken place to the time that we get to Nineveh with the book of Nahum, we're talking like a century that has passed. Uh, some biblical uh, his historians say that the time between Jonah and Nahum would be like the equivalent of the time of our civil war to where we are now in 2020. So we're talking about 150 some years later after Jonah preached repentance, after they did repent, and after God had showed mercy and love and he spared them the destruction he had promised. Now the people have once again turned away from the repentance before God, back to their wickedness, back to their evil ways, and God has finally said, I've had enough of you. 
In fact, I didn't put this on your outline or on the screen, but when you look at chapter 2, verse 13, there the Bible, God is talking to Nineveh. He says, behold, I am against you, says the Lord. I tell you what, that's a position you don't want to be in, right? I mean, I don't want to be in a position where God says, I am against you. The God of gods, the king of kings, the creator of the universe is telling these people, I have now decided that I'm fed up with your wickedness and your sin and your treatment of my people. So I am done putting up with you. You will be utterly destroyed. And history tells us that the Babylonians and the Medes, they come in and they completely destroy Nineveh in 612 B.C., just as Nahum predicted that it would happen and just as God said it would happen because when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. Always has, always will. And here we see a, a blatant example in the Old Testament of a principle that the Apostle Paul preaches in the New Testament that, that you reap what you sow. And when you read chapter 2 and 3, God is basically telling Nineveh through Nahum that they are about to reap what they're going to sow. So it's a sequel to Jonah, but very different messages. Number two, here's the second lesson I want you to learn from this little book. The book of Nahum proclaims the justice of God. The book of Nahum proclaims the justice of of God. We live in a time today and we are seeing this in some very harsh realities throughout our world, especially right now in this, this crazy civil and racial and political unrest that we're experiencing as a country and even here in, in our own town in, in Lodi, where people become very angry. They express outrage. They have protests that often turn into these violent acts of, of, of terror and, and, and destruction and rioting if they believe a judge was too soft on someone, if they believe that someone committed a crime that was due a certain punishment and the judge to whom they go before doesn't enact the punishment that they think fits the crime, they become outraged by this. And then we're seeing that in a big way today. And next week, when we get to the prophet Habakkuk, now some of you are a little bit ahead on this because you've been involved with our Wednesday night midweek Bible study through Zoom. And a month ago, we went through Habakkuk. And Habakkuk is asking this very question. He's saying, how long, Lord, why, God, when people sin and when the unjust seem to scoff in your face, do you not judge them? Do you not react? Do you not punish? And God says, listen, I'm going to do it. And what we learn here in Nahum is that God is a God of justice and righteousness. And when he says that if you don't keep in line with what I ask you to do in my word, you will face my judgment. And Nineveh experiences that in a very real and a very powerful way. Now, the Bible clearly teaches that God is a God who is full of grace. He's a God that's full of mercy. He's a God that's full of kindness and forgiveness. The Bible says that God is love. Not that he just does love, but that he is love. But we also have to understand that God is holy and God is righteous and God is is just. Now we often through the pages of scripture and in our own lives we often see that God's mercy and God's grace and God's forgiveness and God's kindness and God's love overrides his justice. That's the whole point of what Jesus did for us on the cross. We didn't earn that. We didn't deserve that. And yet God allowed Jesus to take the place for us to pay the penalty of the price of sin that we couldn't pay. But I want you to notice in Nahum, the way Nahum portrays God, how Nahum shows who and what God is to his people that they find hope in this and to his enemies that should find terror in this. So Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 on your outline. I want you to notice the but, the B-U-T in these next two verses. Nahum 1 verse 3. 
the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. The Bible says that God is, yes, slow to anger. He's so patient. And we know that's true because we know part one of the story of Nineveh. We know what happened with Jonah. They didn't deserve that then. They didn't deserve it. They were just as wicked then in the things they were doing as they are now in the stuff that Nahum and, and God is condemning them for. But in the story of Jonah, they repented. That shows God's slowness to anger. That he didn't wipe him out the first time he said he was going to. But not only is he slow to anger, he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Here Nahum is quoting the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 14, verse 18, where it says God is slow to anger. That God is willing to forgive us our sins and our trespasses, but he's also great in power. And he won't leave the guilty unpunished. Then in chapter 1, look at verses 7 and 8 here on the screen, also on your outline. Verse 7, the Lord is good. He is a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Oh, that's good news. But verse 8 has a but. But verse 8, with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of of darkness. God is a God who is good, yes. He's a God who is, provides refuge when we're in trouble, yes. He cares for those who trust in him, yes. But he is still just. And the time will come when we will stand before a God who is just and holy and who will judge. And Nineveh, the, the, the nation of Assyria, is about to learn in a very real and very powerful way that God's forgiveness can only be extended to those who are willing to accept his forgiveness. That God will only put up with our wickedness when we're willing to repent and turn from that wickedness. And Nineveh had got to the point that they refused to do that so God had got to the point that his justice must prevail because God is just now let me give you one more number three here's the hope of the book for we who believe the book of Nahum offers a Messiah moment the book of Nahum offers a Messiah moment Messiah is the Hebrew word for, or the Greek word for, 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 the, uh, for Jesus, for, for, for the one who is to come. The Messiah is Hebrew, Greek is Christ, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. And throughout the Old Testament, there is time and time again that we see Messiah moments, that you see Jesus or you see Christ moments in the Old Testament. In fact, most scholars, they say that, that they conservatively estimate based on study from Genesis through the end of the Old Testament before you get to anything written in Matthew that there are over 300 different prophecies that point to the Messiah and there are there are direct prophecies like where he's going to be born and how he's going to be born and and how he's going to die and what he's going to do and here in Nahum we get this sneak peek at a Messiah moment Nahum chapter 1, verse 15. This is the first verse we looked at. This is where I got the name for this message, feet that bring good news. Look again at this text. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Here God is talking about the destruction of Nineveh. The, 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 the end of the terror of the nation of Assyria. And to the people of God, to Judah who's been suffering under Assyria, who's been suffering under this great city of Nineveh, this is good news. And it says it's a good news that proclaims peace. Now what's interesting here, the Hebrew noun that is there translated peace, it can also be used to mean deliverance, or freedom from an enemy. So when you think about it that way, this absolutely makes sense. Here's some good news for my people, not for Nineveh, 
not for the Assyrians, but for everyone who Assyria has been oppressing, and especially for God's people, God is reminding us that he has not forgot about his children, that, that he is sending some good news that they are going to experience salvation and they're going to experience peace. What kind of peace? It's a rescue. It's a rescue from the turmoil and, and the trials and the suffering and, and this, this oppressive regime that is over them. They're about to experience the peace that comes when God brings the good news of his salvation. Now, Isaiah, we call Isaiah one of the major prophets only because his book is so much bigger compared to books like Nahum that's only three chapters. But Isaiah uses this phraseology in Isaiah 52, verse 7, here on, the out, on your outline, it's on the screen. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim, and here's this same Hebrew word, who proclaim peace. And then Isaiah goes on to say, they bring good tidings and they proclaim salvation. Who say to Zion, your God reigns. So here the good news is God's salvation that was coming. And it was coming uh, for uh, Isaiah. He's talking about the Babylonian captivity. Isaiah is looking ahead. Isaiah is prophesying about what's going to happen when Babylon, which they're the ones who come in with the Medes that wipe out the Assyrians, then they take power. And when Babylon takes power, they take the southern kingdom into captivity. And the, those who are not taken into captivity, they're scattered uh, throughout. And now Isaiah is saying, here's some good news of peace because salvation's going to come to you. Now, this is, a, this is a foreshadowing. This is a Jesus. This is a Messiah moment that salvation is going to come through Jesus. But for Isaiah's readers and for I, the children of God, rather, later who come under Babylonian captivity, their salvation comes. Their good news is that they are allowed to return to Jerusalem. They are allowed to rebuild God's holy city and to rebuild the temple. And then nearly a thousand years, over 700 years later, the Apostle Paul in the, in the New Testament uses this exact same phrase. So you have it in Nahum where Nahum is talking about the good news is that Assyria will no longer enslave God's people. And then Isaiah uh, prophesies and predicts that the good news will be that the Babylonians will no longer enslave God's people because salvation is coming. And now the apostle Paul is going to apply this to Jesus who's going to bring salvation, not from an oppressive kingdom or a nation, but rather from sin. So look in chat, Romans chapter 10. This is the last text here on the screen. It, it's, it's on your outline. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But then Paul asked this question, how then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, and here he is quoting this, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. See, just as Judah celebrated the good news of deliverance from their enemies in the Old Testament, so today we rejoice in the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, who has set us free from the captive of sin, who sets us free from the captive of hurts in our lives. We, we uh, hear the, the one that is the, the, the beauty of the feet are the ones who are bringing the gospel. Yes, it's talking about preachers, but it's talking about anyone who will take what, what defeats feet do feet take you someplace and anytime that you and I in the way that we live and the things that we say when we take the gospel when we take the good news when we take the truth that Jesus offers salvation to those around us we are the ones who are the beautiful feet that are bringing good news in the book of Nahum it wasn't good news for Nineveh. For the Assyrians, it was too late. 
their wickedness, their sin, their refusal to repent, their, their, their outright rejection of God has caused them to face a God who is, yes, merciful and loving and forgiving, but who also is righteous and holy and just. It was too late for them. But the good news is, for us, it's not too late. This is why the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. And, and if you're listening to this this morning, I, I don't know where you are. I, I, I don't know when you're watching this, where you're watching this from. And, and, and I don't know what your relationship between you and God is. But if you do not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to bring you good news. And the good news is that salvation has come. That forgiveness of sin is in life. That, that anything that might seem like it is oppressing us. We, we're going through some stuff that feels pretty oppressing right now. Amen? We really are. But we're not facing anything like God's people felt under, under the Assyrians or like God people experienced under Babylon. But yet anything that can bring us down, God offers freedom from that. God offers salvation from that. And man, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ for salvation, why not today? We, we would love to talk with you, to pray with you, to share with you a little bit more if you don't know what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we could do that for you, just let us know in the comments. S send us an email. If you have my contact, reach out to me or reach out to one of our pastors, one of our elders, one of our shepherds here. Because I know they would love to talk with you a little bit more about the good news of salvation with Jesus Christ. For a lot of us, we have been experienced, we know what it means to, to be saved, to be baptized into Christ, but maybe we haven't been living like we've been believing. It's not too late. It's never too late to turn to a God who, yes, is just and righteous and holy, but who is loving and forgiving and kind. And I would encourage you to do that as well. Let me pray for you. Father God, I ask a blessing upon anyone here in this right now. Lord, I pray that, that we would uh, be willing to be the good feet who could take the good news of your salvation. Father, whether it's uh, through, through means like this, reaching out to people uh, through the internet or through cards and letters and calls, but also, Father, in the way that we live and the way we interact with those around us, let us be feet, let us be hands, let us be a mouth that proclaims salvation through Christ and in him alone. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name and amen. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. I hope to see you at our outdoor service, 9 a.m. Sunday mornings. Till then, I hope to see you back here online as well. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am the dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all the day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. We are a moment, you are forever, Lord of the ages, God before time. We
be unto your name. Be Jesus, the church said, Amen. Amen.